So I'm going to talk um, a little bit more now uh, about the research, if you like, that's ongoing. Some of the findings, some of the direction, uh, just to give you a little bit of a feel for what we're doing. And also, I was, was asked to talk a little bit about the sort of international collaborations and, and so on that, that are, if you like, uh, underline that. So research into SCAD, research into any condition, requires a kind of quorum of uh, data. So we need enough information to be able to start to understand things. And of course, you know, part of that is also being able to build all that <laughs> data together. Um, and that applies across lots of studies. But for example, genetic studies, you need enough people um, who have the problem and also, importantly, enough people who don't to be able to make a comparison to see whether there is an association. And one of the things when Alice was talking earlier that she mentioned, and I just wanted to bring out again, is that we are also enormously grateful to a whole bunch of healthy uh, volunteers who, have, uh, who, who don't have SCAD who have come to Leicester to allow us to scan them, to take their blood, to take their skin, biopsies and things, to allow us to have comparator data. And that is something, again, for everybody in the room to think a little bit about, because as we move forward, we're going to need those controls again. Because unless we've got something to compare things against, it's difficult for us to be certain what's abnormal. And this is particularly true for this disease. Because when you go out there and look in the literature and say, well, we can just compare it to what's in the literature. But there isn't a literature on women, very little literature on women with heart disease. Because all of the clinical trials, a lot of the clinical trials are very male-centric because it's a more frequent problem in men. So we've also, or we are also aware that in the UK we have... Uh, this fantastic uh, uh, SCAD survivor group. But in parallel, that is also happening elsewhere. And I've just you know, listed a few where many of you will, uh, will be aware of the Mayo Clinic series and the Vancouver series, but also across Europe and Australasia, there are also groups of patients with SCADs who are coming together in a very similar way with their clinical teams to start to think about both the clinical management of uh, SCAD but also the research side of things. Start to top these numbers up and you start to get quite big numbers of patients uh, and that increases your ability to start to uh, do things. So what we really need to do is to bring all of this lot together with sufficient resources to be able to uh, study SCAD. Now that's a difficult process. Uh, and uh, sometimes, as hard as you try, you get knocked back down again. And, you know, we've had some experience of that in terms of our SCAD research and bringing funding into the research program to enable us to move forward. But we're still here. We're still making process with progress, uh, doing analyses, and with BeatScan support, we're continuing to build on that body of data. And, you know, again, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I... I stand and do the whittering, but there are lots and lots of people uh, who are responsible for looking after SCAD patients across the UK and for building on this research. And this is actually a bunch of the members of the European SCAD study group who, uh, you know, despite all of the Brexits and everything else, are supporting us in, uh, in, in our research programme. They all look really knackered because I get them in at about seven o'clock in the morning so that they don't miss any of the meetings. So they come in for a breakfast meeting. We give them a couple of croissants to bribe them to attend. <laughs> and the SCAD study group, I'm not going to read all of these things out, but essentially is about collaboration. I started the first talk with this statement that collaboration, this is collaboration, this is collaboration between us as clinicians and researchers and yourselves as patients and also as healthy volunteers and relatives supporting us. So we want to collaborate with people because it, it gives research uh, greater power, it enables us to answer the questions more quickly and it, it, you know, it also enables us to start 
make sure that as we learn about SCAD and what we should and should, you know, how we should be doing things, that we disseminate that so that the experience that you've just heard about, which you know, hopefully is less common, but I think it still happens, of patients you know, not being diagnosed efficiently and swiftly so that that hopefully starts to reduce. We also want to link into things. So we, this year, written together with our uh, study group partners, the uh, position statement, I flashed it up to you earlier. And yet, if you go and read the European uh, new European guidelines on acute myocardial infarction, so heart attacks. You go and read that document. SCAD is not mentioned at all. Dissection is mentioned as a single word in that document at the moment. So we've still got a long way to go. And what I'm trying to point out here is that we need to work with other bodies, other groups. We need to make sure that we're uh, we're working with the, 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 the groups that are focused on cardiology with women, with stenting, the stenting groups, the interventional cardiologists, to make sure that the message gets out there properly. Uh, and that's the basis, if you like, of the study group. And what we're doing in the study group now, uh, and we're building, is a European-wide registry and that's been supported by the European Society of Cardiology. In the world of Europe, everything has four-letter acronyms. So we're the ACA study group supported by the ESC, and the, uh, and the registry is an EORP registry. There you are. But the important thing is that this is bringing everybody together so that we can start to do research uh, as a European partnership. And potentially, what we also want to do, which was mentioned by Alice again earlier, is try to go earlier so that we can get closer to the SCAD patients at the start of the process rather than a little bit later because there may be important things that we can learn earlier on in that process. So I'm going to just talk through a few of the collaborative projects that we're engaged with at the moment. We've talked uh, a little bit about the SCAD OCT study and I presented some data from that. Those OCT images, <coughs> OCT is something that's not done in many centres actually, it's, it's still uh, not a widespread technology. And so those data that uh, Rob worked on uh, came from uh, both us in the UK, but also colleagues in Spain, the Czech Republic and Brazil. Uh, and there remain key questions which we are still looking at at the moment. So at the moment we're looking at those uh, OCT images and we are also looking at some pathology images, putting those together so that we understand the images better. And one of the key questions in this area is the question as to whether SCAD and FMD have an equal sign between them. It's very tempting to put one there. Um, but actually, it may be things can overlap without being the same thing. And not my instinct is that that is the case. But in some of the literature and some of the international uh, uh, authors on SCAD would essentially almost put an equal sign here and say it's the same disease. But it may not be, and I think we can hopefully answer that. And I think one of the other questions that we're hoping to answer with this study is whether coronary inflammation uh, is a causative problem in SCAD. And this is some data that has come from the pathology study. Now, this is uh, data that's come from a, a small number of international cases of patients who have not survived SCAD. And obviously that's tragic. But these are families who want us to learn about SCAD and have... Uh, have given their uh, active consent to allow us to study this. And this is important because what this is showing us is that if you look at the literature, everybody talks about the inflammatory process in the coronary artery. And obviously one question is, is this inflammation? Is it inflammation in the artery which causes that dissection process, that outside-in thing that I was talking about earlier on? And this is data that Marios Margaritis, uh, who's working on this uh, uh, with um, Mary Shepherd in London, again as part of the European group, has been looking at. And essentially this, the summary is what he finds is that the inflammation increases the later in time the imaging is done. And what that tells us, I think, is that the inflammation is a consequence and not a cause. 
So it's again, rather like the microvessel story, it's probably going to turn out to be a healing reaction rather than anything else. But again, this is a partnership across uh, three countries. Um, so this is just looking at some of the things uh, in the OCT images, and you need to have, uh, you need to be experts, but I know you're getting to be experts at this now, uh, to understand them. But there are a number of little things that, that, that Rob Jackson has highlighted here where we wonder what this is. These look odd. They're unusual appearances. What's going on? Is this healing? Is this information? What exactly is going on here? And again, the way to answer this is to take these pictures with our pathology <coughs> pictures, put them together, and then we can say to the cardiologist, this is what you are looking at, because we can look under the microscope and answer the question. So... What about the peripheral vascular imaging? We've talked uh, quite a lot already about FMD. And here are some of the key questions, if you like, that have emerged in our discussion here and uh, you know, are things that we hope to answer. So what is the true prevalence of FMD in SCAD? Is it an equal sign? Is it that 86% that was quoted a little bit earlier on, the top end of the scale? Um, that the Canadian series suggests it's very, very common, or is it more like the sort of 25-30% that other studies have shown? How important is it if we find it? I was alluding to this in some of the discussions earlier. So the presence of FMD is all well and good, but is it something that we need to do anything about? Is it something that we need to do follow-up imaging to look at over time and see how it changes? And, you know, or is it essentially incidental in most people? So is it okay just to look for symptoms or do we need to do serial scanning? And there was a, a, a question about that. So we don't know the answer to the, all of that. And then again, Abby has alluded to this question, is CT required? So the advantage of CT it has a slightly higher spatial resolution, so you can see things in a little bit more detail than MRA. But the disadvantage is, is it requires x-rays and a dose of x-rays. And x-rays have this small increased associated cancer risk. So we have to get that balance right. And we're trying to answer that with the study. Uh, at the moment, we are just waiting for a few more paired scans. So what we've done is we've done a big MRI study in the world of SCAD, a big MRI study. And we've compared it to healthy volunteers. And we've analysed it completely blinded, it's called. That doesn't mean we haven't got any, uh, you know, we're sort of uh, in blackout blinds or something like that. It just means that we've sent it, in fact, we've sent it to the Franco-Belgian FMD group, who are the world experts in FMD. But we haven't told them who's healthy and who's got SCAD. So they don't know. So they're going to just report those scans as they see them. And the advantage of that, we were talking a little bit about it earlier, is if they see a little bit of wiggle or a little bit of irregularity, they are forced to call it. So if they say it's FMD, then they have to say it's FMD, but they don't know which the patient is. So when we then unblind it, we will find out what the true incidence of FMD is in SCAD patients. Now, that's an incidence that would be measured by MRI, but what if MRI is not sufficiently good as CT to do this? Now, we can't do CT in healthy patients because of the X-ray dose. So what we've done is, and what we've acquired, is a number of people that are in the study who have paired MRA as well. So they've had the CT imaging to look for it, and then they've had MRA as well, and we have fi we're aiming to get 50 of both. I think we're about 36 at the moment, so that we can then say to the literature, OK, we have compared both of these things, and either yes, we think CT is better, or no, it's not. So it may be that CT is a little bit more sensitive, but maybe you don't actually need to know about that very subtle little bit of irregularity that you might see. Or maybe you do, maybe it's important. So hopefully that's something that the study will be answering in the coming, I think, short period of time. So. For, for those of you, I mean, I think you're pretty, pretty familiar with these kind of images, but there's a picture up there, little uh, aneurysms. You can th see the little things that look like berries that you might pick from a bush, little swellings there. Down in B, you can see these sort of areas of narrowing. That, that's what fibromuscular dysplasia looks like in the ilex. Abby showed lots of pictures of that. 
uh, and then some little uh, swellings and, uh, and, uh, 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 and dilations which you get. But this is what I was alluding to earlier. So uh, you could say, according to this study here in 2013, that 86% of people have uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. Or you might go with um, this one down here, which says that it's, I'm trying to remember what it was, about 20 or you know, maybe 30%. So at the moment, across these observational studies, there's a massive degree of vari variation. Uh, and I think it's really important for us to understand what is the overlap? How big is it? Is it everybody or is it a small proportion of patients? And then once we've done that, we need to understand how important it is. So, and, you know, and therefore, what we should be doing about it. And I think over time, this isn't immediate, but over time, what we will then want to do is to bring back a proportion of patients for repeat imaging so that we can then answer the questions that were out in the audience earlier about does it progress, does it stay the same or not? So uh, some other uh, international studies. We all know, for, again, some of you who've been to Leicester, that we're very interested in looking at the coronary arteries, particularly of those patients who've had not been stented with a conservatively managed SCAD. And this is a collaboration between us in the UK, colleagues in Spain and New Zealand in particular. And our question here is, first of all, can CT be used to diagnose or exclude SCAD? So we know that lots of patients with SCAD come back to hospital with chest pain. So as doctors, one of our challenges there is, do we take them back to the cath lab and have another look or not? How do we decide whether we think they're okay or whether they've had another small dissection or not? We can look at the troponin, that's important. But even if the troponin is a little bit up, if the patient's well, do we want to go back in to do an angiogram or is it okay to leave things alone? And going back to do an angiogram, okay, there's an x-ray dose with the angiogram, but also what we know from the studies is that um, in SCAD patients, for whatever reason, well, for the reason that the arteries are a bit more fragile, there does seem to be an increased risk of catheter-induced dissection. So that's when actually popping the little tube in to take the picture actually damages the artery as well. So we don't want to have to do angiograms unless we really need to. Sometimes we do. But if we could avoid it by doing a CT scan in patients where it wasn't absolutely necessary, that could be quite useful. Um, and the second question is trying to understand how useful uh, CT could be in following those things up, in understanding how healing occurs, and also in potentially identifying those small number of cases where, where there's, there are issues with healing or delayed healing. And we're working closely with partners in Oxford who have some very novel and new software that helps to look at the areas around the coronary arteries, so where the dissection occurs, particularly looking at that inflammation signal that I was talking about a little bit earlier on, that might provide a new and novel way of using imaging to specifically diagnose SCAD. And it's early days, we've done a couple, it looks interesting and we need to do some more and obviously one of the challenges here again is that we want what we really need is very early CT scans and ideally paired with the latest CT scans. There's not, we don't have many of those which is why we need all of our friends in the world to help us to get that data set together. And you know this, just to show you some of the or not yeah show you some of the uh, just pick what you can see with CT so this is just an example in the, in the boxes where the dissection is. You can see the angiogram pictures on the top, CT pictures that you can see, and then after healing along the bottom line there. So CT has a place, but CT of the coronary arteries, it doesn't have, again, it has, has a slightly lower spatial resolution, so it's difficult to see further down the arteries sometimes and get a very clear picture. So it may have a place, but it's not absolutely clear at the moment how we define that place. We've also been doing, or Abby's been doing, I'm claiming all of this, but Abby's done all the work, um, that uh, we've been doing ultrasound scans. And again, uh, Abby's done a lot of ultrasound scanning uh, in Leicester. And also, uh, I know a number of you have been helping our collaborators in, in, collaborator in Pisa uh, and our collaborators in France to, who have a sort of extra uh, high spatial resolution ultrasound scanner 
to really look at the arteries uh, in detail and see whether there are abnormalities in, uh, in, the, in the structure or the function. And again, we're sort of putting all of this data together, but there is certainly a suggestion that we can see things. Now, the, you know, this, again, these things could be important. They could be useful markers, could be ways to you know, screen family members, this kind of thing. If we can find something non-invasive that we can look at in patients, it may be useful. So um, I love this because this is a sort of just use your eye stuff. It's like ultrasound. So if, if you look at the top is the healthy control and the bottom one is SCAD. And if you've got really beady eyes, you can hopefully see that between the two bright lines here, there's this sort of extra white line. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that we are seeing. It's also been described in the fibromuscular dysplasia population, so it suggests that it's you know, related to the same type of issue. And again, we obviously need to understand a little bit more about that. And the combination of the data that Abby's been getting in the Fuchsia study in PISA, we hope will give us a lot more understanding of that. We've also been looking at endothelial dysfunction. This is where you put the blood pressure cuff up and see how the blood vessels react. And we're very interested in this, uh, in this area, the area of you know, whether the arteries um, have a, a tendency to go into spasm, whether they have an, just an abnormal way in which they react. So we know that arteries can dilate. When you do exercise, your arteries and the rest of your arteries in your body are sort of there to... The idea is that they get a bit bigger, allow more blood to go, so you can, uh, you know, break the land speed. Well, maybe not that, but, you know, uh, go and exercise. But uh, our question is, in SCAD patients, is part of the problem maybe that that process of, you know, dilating and constricting may not be quite right. And certainly, this is just, again, looking at the arteries in the arm, the forearm arteries, there does seem to be a difference in how the artery dilates in response to blood flow uh, compared in SCAD patients compared to healthy volunteers. So again, some start of um, some hints from the data that we're getting. I was supposed to talk about genetics, so I thought I'd leave that for the first 20 minutes or so. Uh, oh, I've got 10 minutes left, oh my goodness. Um, so uh, you know I'll stick to that, don't you? Um, so genetics, uh, so we're just gonna talk about that. So, and again, I think this is a sort of prime example, but they're all, all of these things are, are collaborative, really, to get to the answers. And this is the, this is the study, and it's us, and the US, the Mayo Clinic in New York, Australia, and the New Zealand group have been sending samples to the Australian group. France uh, and Belgium have all been contributing to this work, and I hope that that partnership will continue. At the moment, um, it's based around trying to understand this, and we've talked a lot about this, which is this f idea of overlapping conditions and trying to understand them. So we know we've got SCAD, we know we've got FMD, there's carotid dissection, doesn't seem to overlap greatly with SCAD, but there are one or two uh, cases that we know where that's happened. Connective tissue disorders uh, and other uh, uh, aneurysms and dissections. And the reason for showing this is just that it potentially gives us some ideas about where to start to look. So let's think about inheritance in SCAD. And this is a very common question that people have. So the first thing to say is that most cases appear to be sporadic. When we look across the world, there are a small number of uh, familial cases. So that's siblings, so sib-sib pairs, so sisters or mother-daughter pairs that have been described. But the rate of those is very, very low. If you are one, tell us, because you will be extremely special and useful to study from a genetic perspective. So I'd lob that out there in case you happen to have a twin sister uh, and you haven't told us about that. Um, but the most important message here is that this does not seem to be strongly inherited in that sense in which if I've got the disease, my kids are going to get the disease, okay? What it seems to be is that the genetics here is more complex. So there may be risk factors. So you may have some genetic risk that means that you're at higher risk of scan. And we'll come on to something that we've been looking at in that area in a moment or two. But it's not likely that in most cases, it's going to be one gene which passes through the family, okay? The exception to that is the very small number of patients 
who have known hereditary connective tissue disorders. Those are your Marfan's patients, for example, uh, who will have more of a specific gene. So we've been working with uh, collaborators predominantly in France and also in Belgium, looking at what are called rare variants. So what we're trying to find here is, are there a small number of patients with SCAD who have genes which we can identify that may be contributing, that are specific to them? And we've been looking at these genes that are called, uh, called TGF-beta. doesn't matter really what they're called, but they're, those are genes which are known to be associated with dissections elsewhere, particularly aortic dissections. Uh, and we've also been looking at other genes that have been associated with connective tissue disorders. Now, this is what you call a candidate gene approach. So what we're doing is saying, we found in the literature stuff that we think is to do with connective tissue disorders and stuff that people have associated with dissections or arterial diseases. Let's start with that. And we uh, are in the process of working through that data at the moment. And certainly what we are finding is that uh, these things are not common. They're certainly rare in the population as a whole. And most of the people... The, the very small number of people that we're finding will be people that have other things which, if you like, make it clear that they actually have a hereditary connective tissue disorder, for example, rather than the sporadic SCAD where there's nothing uh, else that you can find. So the other thing that we've been working on in this group is that we've now identified it's not quite published, but it's been submitted for publication now, um, which is what's called a common variant. It has the profoundly unmemorable name of FACTAR1 or e e EDN1, uh, and you'll be pleased to learn that it's on the sixth chromosome on position Q24, so uh, I shall be testing you on that later on. Uh, the, uh, uh, the allele is even less memorable and has a long number. This is essentially a little piece of DNA which uh, in which it's just that there's just a very slight change. Okay? Now, the key thing about this finding is that it is a common variant. What does that mean? What that means is that this gene is commonly found in the population. So there are lots of people out there who have this gene variant. The vast majority of them do not have SCAD and will not have SCAD. Okay? But if you have SCAD, you are more likely to have this gene. So it's telling us a bit about the mechanisms of how SCAD works, because we know what this gene does, or we think we might know what this gene does. But what it's not saying is, here is a gene that's going to pass to my kids, and if I've got it, my kids have got it, and they're all going to have SCAD in it. You know, it's not like that. This is a risk variant. So it's a bit like smoking something that lots of people do, and if they do it, they're more likely to have a heart attack. Well, this is a gene which lots of people have got, but if they've got it, you're more likely to have SCAD. It's that, it's that kind of thing, okay? But the important thing here is that this is the first genetic association with SCAD that has been described, okay? Also, and the reason that we looked for it, is because it's been associated with fibromuscular dysplasia, carotid dissection, and migraine. And we know that carotid dissection, unusual but does occur in SCAD, fibromuscular dysplasia, we've just spent the last two and a half hours talking about. And uh, migraine is something that we've very much observed in our population, others have observed in, in their populations, seems to be an increased prevalence in the SCAD population. Again, it doesn't mean everybody gets migraine, but it does seem to be of that overlapping populations that we were looking at earlier, it's one of those overlapping things. In order to get to this answer, we studied 1,055 patients and 7,000 controls. And this could only be achieved by international collaboration because at the moment we don't have 1,055 patients in the UK. Um, and this is just showing you the data from the different groups. And part of this is to show you that it's very consistent. If you look at the French, UK, Australian and the Mayo Clinic, everybody shows the same thing with this variant. 
So it's not just that somebody else, five-ish minutes. Um, but also, you won't be statisticians. But if, uh, maybe some of you are, I don't know. If you are, you need your help too. Um, uh, if it, we would accept a p-value of less than 0.05, maybe if we were being uh, hard on ourselves, 0.01. Well, this thing has a p-value of less than whatever it is, 10 to the minus 21. So that's noughts, you know, 20 noughts before the end of it. So this is very strongly significant. It definitely is a risk variant for SCAD. Interestingly, this is more hypothesis-generating data. It's a hint, but it does seem to be more strongly associated with SCAD than FMD. The p-value between those two things doesn't quite get to that magical 0.05. I think it's 0.07. There's a suggestion that it might be a, you know, particularly important, shall we say, in SCAD. So how does this work? What is it doing? Well, we don't understand all of this. Clearly, you can imagine we're very interested in it. One of the suggestions, and again, this is a variant that's been studied, and, and again, this is in quite interesting too. So it's a variant that is associated with atherosclerotic myocardial infarction and atherosclerotic disease, but in the opposite direction. So the variant that's associated with SCAD is slightly protective against ischemic heart disease, against the other sort of heart disease. So it's the other variant that's the risk for conventional heart disease. So it works in the opposite direction. This gene, helpfully or unhelpfully perhaps, sits in what's called a non-coding region. So it doesn't actually code for a gene in and of itself, this bit. And it's probably something that modulates genes. We call them enhancers. It's something that affects how the gene is made to work. Difficult to know exactly which gene, but close by is a gene that we know is very important in cardiovascular disease, and that's a gene called endothelin. And it uh, codes for uh, a hormone which circulates around in the body and causes constriction of blood vessels and causes all sorts of other things, but it's a very vasoactive thing. Very preliminary data again, but we've measured endothelin levels in those SCAD patients who have the gene variant and those that do not, and we find that there is a difference in the circulating endothelin level. In fact, it goes the other way to what I might have thought, and it's in fact that it's lower in the variant population rather than higher. But nonetheless, it does suggest that it's having an impact on this gene. And obviously, we need to have a big think about that. So that's genetics. Pregnancy-associated SCAD, I wanted to mention quickly again. Uh, so we have a col big collaborative study at the moment. UK, the States, and France predominantly. We think we're going to be the biggest single contributor to that study. But that will be the biggest study by far of pregnancy-associated uh, SCAD so far. Um, some of you will be involved with that. Some of you uh, will uh, no doubt be contacted about it as well. Um, and uh, so thanks for completing those additional questionnaires, those, that, those of you who have, uh, have had those. Uh, and, you know, I think we're hoping to get that finished again in the next month or so. Uh, and then uh, some of Anya's work is uh, the, some of the cellular work, so taking the uh, little bits of skin biopsy. And what Anya does is she very carefully puts those uh, biopsies into a culture medium at the right temperature, nurses them until the cells grow out, and then that gives us cells that we can then do experiments on. And uh, our collaborator who works in New York is doing a big study using these fibroblasts in fibromuscular dysplasia and also, uh, to a lesser extent, in SCAD. And again, our plan is to work closely with him to look at it, what's called the transcriptome, which is the bits, the, bit, the bits of the gene that are then made into proteins, trying to understand those. So, you know, the details aren't necessarily important, but just to show you, if you like, the breadth of what is going on uh, and, you know, our sort of strategy for trying to get to the answers. So, 
it is still the tip of the iceberg. We had a, a question earlier on along the lines of, you know, are we going to get to the bottom of this? Is the research going to give us answers and when? And yes, you know, it is a process, but we are um, doing our best to sort of progress it as quickly as possible. So in terms of the research strategy, you know, we still need you, not just your funding, but you. We need your friends to be healthy volunteers, not necessarily your family members. We may need some of them, um, but certainly age and sex matched controls paradoxically are or, or probably harder to find in some respects sometimes. And uh, all of the nurses in the hospital have already uh, been used in the first study. Uh, I have run out of female relatives. Uh, yeah, I go to family parties now and all of the women just sort of fade away. <laughs> Don't know why that is. Um, we are uh, actively involved with getting uh, um, genetic studies moving. Again, Bex mentioned that is specifically being supported by a donation from BeatScat early on in the year. If you've got your blood pack, if you haven't given blood yet, uh, then you know, let us know. If you haven't had a blood pack, and we'll get you one. If you have had a blood pack and you can find somebody who will take your blood for you, just you know, do what you can. Uh, you know, what we really need is to try and get our numbers up because I think they would offer to sequence 500 patients. We don't have 500 DNAs at the moment. We're trying to work with our European friends to get our numbers up. Um, but again, I, you know, if we can put those together with the Mayo Clinic, put them together with the French guys, we can really do something special from the gen genetics, genomics side of things. Um, we really need uh, uh, your help to complete questionnaires. I know it is a long and arduous questionnaire, and many of you uh, deserve a medal with Bar for getting to the end of it. Um, but getting that data is crucial, because having gaps in the data makes it incomplete and means that our denominators are always different and it's tricky. So uh, if you can, if you haven't completed the questionnaires, please do. We may give you a little ring at some point and say, look, you know, we'll go through it with you, try and help you out, answer the remaining questions, just to try and get as complete data as we can. Um, skin biopsies, not everybody's cup of tea, but, you know, really important. And again, uh, if you've got those, uh, those friends and family, well not friends, less, less family, more friends, because uh, the families, they've got the genetic links and that makes it harder. But if you've got um, friends who are interested in uh, helping with the research study, then you know, we're, we're very keen to try and get more healthy volunteers, not just for the skin side, also for Alice's imaging study. So they don't have to uh, give a skin biopsy if they don't want to, they'll still, still be useful to us. But if you can persuade them and say, look, we really need that, then Anya will be eternally grateful to you as well. Um, what did I write about? Yes, clinical versus research and imaging was just to say that um, we are working within budgetary constraints. And for that reason, uh, we cannot bring, and we talked a little bit earlier about which populations to do, uh, we cannot at the moment afford to bring everybody and image everybody on the research budget. An MRI is about 550 quid, CT about 350 quid. So you can see how much that adds up. So that's why we're being careful. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't get the scans that you need, though. So we can get the scans that you need. We've talked about the imaging of the peripheral arteries, maybe the CT coronaries, the MRI, on clinical grounds, either in Leicester or London or at your local hospital as required. But it's important for us, in order to not go immediately bankrupt, to... Uh, make sure that the NHS pays for those scans that we need to be able to make decisions about your clinical care and that we keep our research budget for Alice's study looking at very specific research questions. Uh, so that's the reason why the phenotyping is being necessarily selective. Uh, and Anya's already given you a wave. Uh, spreading the word, hugely important. We've talked about ambulance crews, we've talked about rehab teams, you know, uh, I know that uh, Karen was involved in talking to obstetricians uh, and gynaecologists and that, you know, about PSCAD. You know, it really is important. And you know, tell your friends, anybody you know who's a medical healthcare professional, tell them, spread the words as much as you can, get those leaflets out there, because we need to try to make sure that people don't have the experience that we heard earlier on about not having the, uh, the thing identified. Um, I 
uh, also ramble endlessly in other places, and here's a list of some of the places who've <laughs> suffered my company over the last year or so. And we continue to give individual consultant-level advice. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the shut me up thing's gone back up. And, 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 and uh, you know, just as, yes, thank you. Uh, I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm probably stand, stand up and say it at the end, but I just want to say a, a massive thank you to all of you for coming. I'm really pleased that not many of you quit between the first talk and the second. I was impressed <laughs> by your staying power. Um, again, grateful to my colleagues for coming along and talking and listening and participating and being part of all of this. And massive thanks to the BeatScan team. You know, I can only imagine how much time it has taken to put this together. Uh, and a one quick shout out for Will Bradlow, who's my friend who uh, works as a cardiologist here in, in Birmingham and has n nothing particularly to do with SCAD, but um, volunteered to help with the liaison to get, the, to get us uh, into this lecture theatre for today. So thank you to all of you for your massive time and energy to make it.